Hear a conversation between Aneta and Charlotte, first year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now, let's begin. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Bill, this is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part-time work. Now. I just have to complete your details on the computer. Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E? Yes. J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N-E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street student residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's 126. 126. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers or they forget to pass on the messages. So, I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's 0414847748. I'll just check. No, sorry, not 748. It's 749. 0414847749? Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well, anything really, I suppose, though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day, if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten. But I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. OK. Well, I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a, a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation and kitchen work and pizza delivery if you've held a driving licence for 12 months. I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at 7pm and I'm supposed to finish at 11pm, but sometimes they keep me until 2 or 3am. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a 9am lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays, but they never pay me on the correct day, often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick so they couldn't get to the bank. But they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence. But I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? 
Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies. Uh, and this childcare job that just came in this morning. Do you like children? Yes, I do, actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at 3 p.m. Pick up the other two girls who are aged six and nine from the primary school at 3.15. You take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now. Four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so 20 hours a week. You need to contact Mrs uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is 91045629 and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number 252. So you catch the 631 bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace. Walk past the post office to the corner and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. two. You will hear part of a podcast for visitors to the popular holiday region called the Trelaw Valley. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. The valley and estuary of the River Trelore forms an unspoilt, beautiful landscape, rich in both wildlife and sites of historic interest. There are many ways to explore the area, and public transport links are good. It is possible to leave your car behind and travel by boat, train, or bus, with just short walks in between stops. The Trelore Valley Passenger Ferry runs between villages along the river estuary and provides a link with a train station at Barrie, which is about ten minutes' walk from the riverside village of Calton. In the past, the river was the main form of transport in the area, and as in the past, today's ferry service operates according to nature. The river estuary is tidal, and so the ferry timetable differs from day to day, according to the times and height of the tide. The ferry is also seasonal, normally running between April and September, depending on the weather. A timetable for the whole year can be downloaded from the Internet by visiting www.trelorferry.co.uk. If you just want to sit and relax and enjoy the lovely scenery, you can take a river cruise to Calton and back from the nearby city of Plymouth. In the past, steamships brought early tourists along the same route. Queen Victoria and her family enjoyed such a trip in 1856. The journey is quicker these days. The round trip takes between four and five hours, depending on tides and weather. If you prefer, you can travel upriver by boat and return to Plymouth by train.
All cruise boats and trains have wheelchair access. For more information and for departure times, ring Plymouth Boat Cruises on 017-528-23104. Trains run several times a day throughout the year between Calton and Plymouth, with various stops in between. They are used by both local commuters and tourists who want to enjoy the beautiful scenery. The highlight of the journey is crossing the river on the stunning viaduct, which was built at the beginning of the 20th century, and towers 120 feet over the water. It is unnecessary to book, and tickets can be bought on the train. For information about fares and timetables, contact National Rail Enquiries by phone or online. The bus service in the Trelor Valley now connects all train stations and villages in the area. Especially for holidaymakers, there's a rover ticket which can be used at weekends and on national holidays and allows unlimited journeys on those days. The rover ticket provides great value for money and is now even cheaper than it was last year. An adult ticket costs £5.50 a day. Senior citizens can travel for £4.50, and a family ticket for up to five people costs just £12. Tickets can be bought on the bus. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. At the center of the Trelore estuary area is the historic riverside village of Calton. The main road comes into the village from the south, and for those of you who are arriving by bus, it turns left just before the bridge and stops in the lay-by on the left-hand side. From there, it's just a short walk to Calton's various attractions, if you're arriving by car, you have to leave it in the main car park. Go over the bridge and take the first turning on the right. Then go on until you come to the end of that road. It's the only place to park in Calton, but there's no charge. If you're interested in local history, there's a museum in Calton with farming, fishing, and household implements from the late 19th century. As you come in from the south... Cross the river and go straight on the same road until you reach the end. Also, on the subject of history, you can go and see the old mill, which has recently been renovated and put back into use. Turn left before you come to the bridge, then go straight on and then take the first turning on the right. This leads straight there. If you're interested in arts and crafts, there's a potter's studio where you can watch the artist at work. After crossing the bridge, turn left, and it's the second building on the left. Finally, when you feel in need of refreshments, there's a cafe opposite the old boathouse and a picnic area near the mill. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a tutor and a student talking about the history of the scientific method. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Simon. Come in. Take a seat. Now, I wanted to talk to you about your assignment. Yes, the one on the scientific method. That's right. I just wanted to see how you were getting on. Well, I think it's fine. I mean, I haven't done a huge amount of work on it because I've been working on other things. But what I've read so far seems fine. How many of the references that I gave you have you managed to get hold of? Not too many, I'm afraid. It seems that everyone else is working on the same things at the same time. And every time I look, the books are checked out from the library. Right. Well, I think that we can go over the main ground together now. That way, even if you don't manage to go through all the references in detail, you'll still have an overview. What has helped you most so far? I've managed to have a look at three of them. I thought that Johnson made some good points, but it was hard to follow the line of her argument. Bradman was simple and straightforward, and I felt as if I got a lot out of that. I wish I could say the same for Whitaker. To be honest, I didn't get very far with that. OK, that's more or less what I'd expect. So tell me, what have you learned so far about the role of the Egyptians and the Babylonians? Yes. Well, there's evidence that the basic components of the scientific method examination, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis were being used in the early 1600s BC, especially in the treatment of certain illness. Good. Yes, that's right. And the point, of course, is that that represented a considerable advance over relatively simple, non-empirical approaches, which usually attributed anything unknown to the actions of the gods, etc., of course, the Egyptians and Babylonians did this as well, but what we see emerging here is a willingness to base opinion on systematic study of the real world, which is at the root of the scientific method. I see. Right. Yes. And then that reappears later. Yes, although don't get carried away with the idea that it was a simple process of development. By the time we get to ancient Greece let's take the period towards the middle of the 5th century BC, the rules governing the scientific method were practiced on a widespread scale, but there were still many people who believed that real truth could only be acquired by pure rational thought. Plato, of course, had a great influence on the development of the scientific method during this period. Through his academy? That's right. But then, as we know, a great deal of understanding of the scientific method disappeared as the old world order collapsed. It wasn't until the Middle Ages, sometime before the 11th century, that several versions of the scientific method emerged from the medieval Muslim world, all of which stressed the importance of experimentation in science. Right. I think I've got the historical timeline. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The other thing I'm struggling with slightly is actually pinning down precisely what we mean by the scientific method. I wonder if you could give me some pointers on that. Sure. Well, it's best to think of the scientific method as a series of steps in a process which allows us to find answers to questions about the world around us. So the first step is to identify the problem. What is it that you want to know or explain? And then I think the next step is designing an experiment. Hmm. But you can't design an experiment unless you know what you want your experiment to tell you. Oh, yes. 
you need to form a hypothesis to be tested before you design the experiment. So, there's a very clear relationship between hypothesis and experiment. Having designed the experiment, then of course you go on to carry out the experiment. The particular procedure you follow, the protocol, will differ from experiment to experiment, but the underlying principle is the same. You analyse the data from the experiment in order to confirm or disprove your hypothesis. Assuming the experiment is accurate. Oh, yes. If there's anything unusual about the data, or if the results are at all surprising, then you need to ask yourself whether the experiment could be flawed and whether the data could be unreliable. If the answer is yes, then it may be necessary to modify the experiment and go through the process again. So, once you have reliable, valid results, then the final step is to communicate them. The wider scientific community needs to know about the results, and publication in journals is the accepted way. OK, I think I've got the basics. It's going to get more complicated as we begin to look at some people who have criticised the scientific method. So you need to make sure that you understand things up to this point. Let me know if you have any further problems with it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about memory in babies and young children. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We're going to look today at some experiments that have been done on memory in babies and young children. Our memories, it's true to say, work very differently, depending upon whether we are very old, very young, or somewhere in the middle. But when exactly do we start to remember things? And how much can we recall? One of the first questions that we might ask is, do babies have any kind of episodic memory? Can they remember particular events? Obviously, we can't ask them, so how do we find out? Well, one experiment that's been used has produced some interesting results. It's quite simple and involves a baby in its cot, a colourful mobile and a piece of string. It works like this. If you suspend the mobile above the cot and connect the baby's foot to it with the string, the mobile will move every time the baby kicks. Now you can allow time for the baby to learn what happens and enjoy the activity. Then you remove the mobile for a time and reintroduce it some time from 1 to 14 days later. If you look at this table of results, at the top two rows, you can see that what is observed shows that two-month-old babies can remember the trick for up to two days and three-month-old babies for up to a fortnight. And although babies trained on one mobile will respond only if you use the familiar mobile, 
If you train them on a variety of colours and designs, they will happily respond to each one in turn. Now, looking at the third row on the table, you will see that when they learn to speak, babies as young as 21 months demonstrate an ability to remember events which happened several weeks earlier. And by the time they are two, some children's memories will stretch back over six months, though their recall will be random, with little distinction between key events and trivial ones. And very few of these memories, if any, will survive into later life. So, we can conclude from this that even very tiny babies are capable of grasping and remembering a concept. So, how is it that young infants can suddenly remember for a considerably longer period of time? Well, one theory accounting for all of this, and this relates to the next question we might ask, is that memory develops with language. Very young children with limited vocabularies are not good at organising their thoughts. Though they may be capable of storing memories, do they have the ability to retrieve them? One expert has suggested an analogy with books on a library shelf. With infants, he says, it's as if early books are hard to find because they were acquired before the cataloguing system was developed. But even older children forget far more quickly than adults do. In another experiment, several six-year-olds, nine-year-olds and adults were shown a staged incident. In other words, they all watched what they thought was a natural sequence of events. The incident went like this. A lecture, which they were listening to, was suddenly interrupted by something accidentally overturning. In this case, it was a slide projector. To add a third stage, and make the recall more demanding, this accident was then followed by an argument. In a memory test the following day, the adults and the nine-year-olds scored an average 70% and the six-year-olds did only slightly worse. In a retest five months later, the pattern was very different. The adults' memory recall hadn't changed, but the nine-year-olds had slipped to less than 60%, and the six-year-olds could manage little better than 40% recall. In similar experiments with numbers, digit span is shown that is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.